Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for being so very, very numerous. I don't think I've ordered enough peanuts and lumpiaatjes, so please feed the students first because they're hungry. Mevrouw de Dekaan, ladies and gentlemen. Over the past 20 years, I have collected a large corpus of data, cultural and historical, from many different countries. My aim was to chart how the modern nation-state was created in the 19th century, the century of Romanticism. 19th century nation-building started with cultural consciousness raising in a process that I have called Romantic Nationalism. The leading figures were intellectuals, artists, and writers. They exchanged their ideas in a transnational network. Romantic nationalism asserts that nations as cultural communities are held together from one generation to the next by language and by an inherited culture. That these nations are the proper body politic of the state and that as such they deserve political empowerment. Romantic nationalism took shape in the Europe-wide resistance against Napoleon. A century later, around the end of the First World War, it bore fruit. From 1918 on, the people's right to self-determination has become a widely accepted principle. The idea of the nation-state has become the universal default. Most people agree that states are defined by their nations and that nations are defined by their inherent and inherited cultural identity. So that is what I have mapped. And I have mapped this with the help of a lot of people, many of them in European studies. Um, and we've been able to go with people like Tim and Simon from Reykjavik and Scandinavia to Baku and Yerevan with the help of Usman, Sara, Aisha and Misha. Uh, Spain with the help of Yolanda and Lily to uh, Ukraine, Russia, Romania and Hungary with the help of Christian, Alex and Christina. Today, I want to explore a little bit what happened to Romantic nationalism after 1918 in the century following the First World War. So, brace yourselves. We're going to cover 100 years. The lecture will move through four stages. So, just so you know what's in store for you because you get, before you get your very small helpings of, uh, of nuts and, and, and drinks. I want to begin with a look at an important 20th century cultural genre, film, the movies. The first talking movie in Dutch cinema history premiered in Amsterdam in early 1934. Ironically, for something that was a talking movie, it was a man known universally as William the Silent. The biopic of William of Orange, leader of the Dutch revolt against Spain, was announced as the country's national film, Nederlands Nationale Film. The publicity poster emphasized that point through a multitude of visual signals, such as the color scheme. In the opening intertitles, the hero is presented in terms of Dutch Protestant moral values. For instance, his sense of justice, rechtvaardigheidsgevoel, and his love of liberty. Not just liberty in general, but specifically for the people of the Netherlands, the vrijheid van het Nederlandse volk. That same Nederlandse volk is also name-checked as the film's audience. The film is offered as a nationally historical document, a national historisch document, to the people of the Netherlands. The Netherlandic people provide both the historical context of the film and its present-day audience. As such, it unites past and present. The invocation also serves to, ser to justify a modern form of commercial mass entertainment by presenting it as a commemorative pedagogical platform for civic values. Activating long-dead historical figures from the past for modern audiences is, of course, nothing unusual. This is part and parcel of belonging to a canon. Canonicity is just that the power to remain topical, even as times change and new media and new technologies emerge. The canonicity of William the Silent is a good example. In the 17th century and the 18th century, he was already celebrated in print with engraved portraits and ambitious now forgotten verse epics. In the 19th century, he received no less than two statues in The Hague, 
one of which shows him as the father of the fatherland and is obviously modeled after the portrait that also inspired the movie poster of 1934. But by 1934, the media landscape was changing. While verse epics were becoming a thing of the past, many new suburbs were being built. And many of those were given street names that evoked the great national past. They could be named after painters or admirals, such as the Ferdinand Bolstraat and the Admiral de Ruiterkade in Amsterdam. In these newly created public spaces, William the Silent had no less than 120 streets and places named after him. These named spaces identify the country in terms of its canonical history and demarcate its territory as nationally distinct. On the map of Europe, the Netherlands is identified by a rash of Willem dots. And when we zoom in, it becomes apparent that there's, there's a marked concentration of them in the Dutch heartland. Other new mass media were also making their appearance. The state could affirm its identity by putting national icons on its banknotes and postage stamps. In addition, there was the new pursuit of cultural tourism. There was in particular that obligatory form of educational tourism that is the school outing, het schoolreisje. The place where Willem was shot in Delft became a destination for such educational pilgrimages. So was the Rijksmuseum, a hall of fame for the nation's canonical heroes. On public television, Willem's life was made the topic of a drama series in 1984, or 18, 1985 it aired, and his celebrity was recanonized when he was elected the greatest Netherlander of all time in 2004. These processes of canonization, self-historicization, and the recycling of narratives have been studied by my colleagues Lotte Jensen, Marita Matthijsen, and To Streng. But the process is still ongoing. The burgeoning genre of the musical, that bombastic celebration of the utterly familiar, is also going to market Willem. After Soldaat van Oranje, we get Oranje de Soldaat, or rather, Willem van Oranje, the musical des Vaderlands. It brings to mind the man's own dying words, my God, my God, have mercy on me and on my, <laughs> and on my poor people. All this belongs to the afterlife of a famous historical character in cultural memory. Documenting an afterlife is not an easy task. The historian has to sift through cultural memories and spot the traces of a canonical icon. It's a bit of a where's Wally exercise. We have to search through masses of pop culture to spot in unexpected corners the familiar figure. The new media that recycle canonicity in the 20th century are characterized by their mass outreach. This was already theorized by Walter Benjamin in his classic essay on the work of art in the age of mechanical reproduction. Benjamin already saw that artworks were becoming commodities. That insight has more recently be been elaborated by Pierre Bourdieu. He distinguishes between restricted and unrestricted cultural production. Restricted is a statue or an expensive 18th century book. There aren't many of them and they are costly. Unrestricted is something on television or a postage stamp. It, it's easily affordable to huge masses of people, almost like a day at the beach. As Bourdieu sees it, restricted forms of cultural production are more prestigious, while mass-produced, unrestricted forms are cheap and down-market. The presence of William the Silent in the 20th century is largely to be found in unrestricted, mass-produced pop culture. Each instance is individually forgettable. There's always a sense of, oh yeah, right, I'd forgotten that, when we recall that TV costume drama or that program on the greatest Netherlander of all time. We are in the realm of what is often called trivial or at best middle-brow culture. That may sound snobbish, but snobbery is how the cultural marketplace works. The symbolic value of cultural products, their prestige, is a question of supply and demand. And as Bourdieu has shown, exclusivity, limited supply, raises symbolic value, while mass supply brings the value down. On the whole, we can see that national icons in the century of mass entertainment grave da gravitate downward in their cultural prestige. As they become more popular, they become trivial. This presents an interesting parallel 
with Michael Billig's famous notion of banal nationalism. Billig has famously pointed out that after a hot period when nationalism was mobilizing political forces, it cooled down and became banal, something taken for granted. The true power of the nation in the contemporary world often lies in its unobtrusive presence as the background noise of the public sphere. The recycling of national symbols on everyday objects like coins or number plates. We have stopped noticing this presence on na of national brands the way we stopped noticing lampposts and traffic signs. That is indeed what renders the nation something habitual, the default plain vanilla flavor of the public sphere. By the way, don't let words like banal or trivial fool you. The power and covert agency of trivial culture and banal nationalism should not be underestimated. When cultural historians look at the culture of the 20th century modernity, we think of it as by definition modernistic. Film history is a good example of this. Cinema as a medium uses a modern technology and it is well suited to a modern style and content. The visual quality is dynamic, expressionistic or avant-garde. Cinematic modernism would seem the very opposite of 19th century romanticism. It avoids lyricism and the idyllic countryside. It celebrates rapid movement and the mechanical aspects of life in the modern world. So it would seem. However, that is not the whole story. We're going to look for where is Wally again. The talking movie on William, William the Silent is part of a very important strand in cinema history, which involves recognized masters of the genre. Sergei Eisenstein made not just Battleship Potemkin, but also the national epic Alexander Nevsky. Fritz Lang made not only the avant-garde Metropolis, but also the Nibelungen, the most important adaptation after Wagner. Of course, Eisenstein's celebration of the national hero Alexander Nevsky was made as a piece of propaganda on the orders of Stalin. But even so, there are a lot of similarities with the liberal entrepreneurial movie about William the Silent. Also, Eisenstein could draw on a canonicity that had been established well before Stalin and precisely in the Romantic 19th century. In this country, there are the street names. In Russia, there were the Russian Orthodox cathedrals dedicated to Alexander Nevsky. Fourteen of these had been built in the late nationalistic 19th century. And while William the Silent Streets were named in the new suburbs on the outskirts of the old cities, the Alexander Nevsky churches were built on the edges of the empire, marking its sphere of influence. We encounter them as cultural outposts in Poland, in the Baltic, in the Caucasus. In a further parallel, Eisenstein's film was only one step in the ongoing relay of the Nevsky cult that would take off again in the 1980s. <clears throat> After the collapse of communism in 1989, the building of Alexander Nevsky churches has resumed. Two new film versions have been made. They tell once again how he defended Russia's western borderlands against the attacks from the wicked west. Trivial, banal, pot boilers, Aragorn in Cyrillic letters. I am bracing myself for the musical. But also an important factor to understand contemporary Russian nationalism and the informal ideological leaf feeding ground of Putin's war against Ukraine. In Michael Billig's terms, the cooling down from hot to banal has gone hot again. Cooling down is not a one-way process. Unlike entropy, it's reversible. Things that had become banal, unnoticeable, suddenly reveal their ongoing power to inspire attitudes and influence political choices. Banality is powerful. A good example to demonstrate this can be found in the British Isles. So, next up. One of the most noticeable recent examples of cultural nationalism was the movie Braveheart, 1995. It was a global success. In the English media, such as The Spectator and The Independent, the film was criticized for its anti-English sentiment. But in Scottish cinemas, audiences were cheering and the Scottish National Party experienced a noticeable boost after Braveheart. Braveheart marked a change. The Hollywood action movie, in which Mel Gibson had played prominent roles alongside Arnold Schwarzenegger and Sylvester Stallone, now turned to the mode of national epic. 
Crisis moments in national history were used to showcase the bulging muscles and the lashings of blood, guts, and testosterone. Braveheart made use of an existing Scottish cult of the national hero, William Wallace. That cult had peaked in the late 19th century when a huge neo-Gothic monument to the hero had been built near the city of Stirling. Since then, the cult had, do, had cooled down, had gone banal. The Stirling monument had become just one of Scotland's less prominent landmarks on the tourist trail. But it was made hot again, very noticeable indeed, thanks to the Gibson movie. Visitor numbers to Stirling rocketed, and the monument was modernized by the addition of a stupendously ugly statue in the park, <laughs> car park, featuring Gibson shouting, Freedom! <laughs> that is how hot and banal can move back and forth. But the case ramifies further. Braveheart not only played into the rise of Scottish nationalism, it also provoked the growing tide of English nationalism. Were there English equivalents to Braveheart? People have drawn attention to a rich crop of movies about Churchill and Dunkirk from the 2010s onwards. Churchill's message that England's finest hour came when, in 1940, she stood alone, was appropriated by the Eurosceptic Tories to mean that if only Britain could stand alone once again, she would reach a fi another finest hour. But the secret weapon that helped foster a sense of English separateness and unilateralism was much less strident, much less hot. It was the very opposite. It took the form of the utterly, utterly anodyne. And here I have to apologize to my dear neighbor, Yannick. Mel, Mel Gibson met his doom when he rang into Maggie Smith. The Scottish Braveheart was countered by the English costume drama Downton Abbey. Innocent feel-good entertainment dressed up in period costumes. No battles here, but the traditional Englishness of four o'clock tea, Miss Marple, Jane Austen, Mary Poppin, and Victorian novels. As my colleague Menno Spearing has shown in a landmark study, this Englishness with its tea and scones, upstairs, downstairs, cottage and countryside traditionalism, with its ironically camouflaged nostalgia, with its sentimentality lurking under the stiff upper lip, this Englishness had been an important strategy in the steady rise of British Euroscepticism since the 1960s. The author of Downton Abbey, Julian Fellows, and incidentally, the, the man you see there, that's not Menno Spielinger, that's Julian Fellows. Uh, <laughs> Lord Fellows um, is an aficionado of Vic, um, the Victorian author of One Nation Toryism. He's been made a lord and sits as a conservative pro-Brexit peer in the upper house. And in one episode, he has plagiarized a wartime propaganda film, Mrs. Minor, from 1942, where Englishness is used to beat not the Scots or the EU, but the Nazis. Handy thing, Englishness. So, both Braveheart and Downton Abbey owed their success in their, to their mastery in reactivating older, dormant cultural and literary models. They tap into a quietly subsisting repertoire that had receded deep into the background. How deep this background radiation of cooled down nationalism can recede, I noticed in 2018 when I visited Anna and we went to a British garden center in the shopping mall of the comfortable middle classes. I spotted a display of DVDs on special offer. They promised comfort viewing on Sunday afternoons or Monday evenings. Prominently displayed were the many BBC costume dramas based on classic 19th century novelists with lashings of local color, Englishness, and period feel. In the next stand, targeting the male rather than the female customers, there was a great selection of war movies. Roman Polanski's The Pianist was flanked by Dad's Army, generous helpings of Churchill, and gung-ho military action stuff. All this recalling Britain's finest hours when, they, when she proudly stood alone remaindered DVDs in a garden center. It doesn't get much more banal or trivial than this. But here, I felt, I came face to face with the deep cultural undercurrents that had delivered Brexit when nobody was expecting it. It is to be found not even in the new productions, but in the ongoing availability of half-forgotten older ones. So, 
In order to understand and diagnose the persistence of romantic nationalism, we must analyze how its cultural repertoire has been kept constantly available and in circulation. We must study the bargain basement of culture. Behind the Scottish National Party, we need to see Braveheart, and behind Braveheart, the Stirling Monument. Behind Putin, we need to see Alexander Nevsky, both the film and the many cathedrals. Behind Boris Johnson, there is Downton Abbey, and behind Dan Downton Abbey, there is Mrs. Miniver and Anthony Trollope, and all that stuff, and the garden centres. Studying the ongoing cultural presence and persistence of romantic national repertoires feels like studying the motion of a dolphin. It startles us and attracts our attention when it rises above the water's surface, glistening in the sunlight, briefly. There she blows. Now you see it, and then you don't. But its trajectory is defined by how it swims underwater, between the moments of its salient visibility. Similarly, we need to understand nationalism, crucially, when it is submerged, becomes invisible. These submerged states are called banal or trivial, but they are neither. Something that can exercise such a powerful influence without even being noticeable deserves a better terminology. I prefer using the notions of salient and latent cultural nationalism, more or less for what Billig calls hot and banal. And my special interest is in the hidden power of the latency state. It is a place where things are felt rather than noticed. Fleeting sensations, briefly experienced. And this brings me to the final part of the, water, of the lecture. Below the waterline, in its latent state, romantic nationalism camouflages itself as something that is so fleeting that it is not even political, something unpolitical. Unpolitical nationalism? <clears throat> Surely that's a contradiction in terms, for what is nationalism if not political? But in fact, nationalism has a habit of denying its political nature. We encounter this unpolitical romanticization of nationalism right at the beginning as it emerged. In 1806, the romantic philosopher Fichte argued that love, the love we feel for our country is as natural and as sweetly human as the love that parents and children feel for each other. Love of the nation is a political extension of family values, as it were. The romantic fairy tale collector Jacob Grimm drew attention to the notion of homesickness. Much as homesickness is a universal affect for people in exile, so too love of one's country is a natural, universal affect. There is nothing political about it, it's anthropological. As the romantic poet Walter Scott put it, only dead souls could be insensitive to the joy of coming home to one's own, one's native land. That sentiment and the line, breeds there the man, became a widely quoted meme, virally echoing far and wide across the century. It's a powerful argument, and I don't wish to dismiss it out of hand. But it did set the tone for a standard rhetoric where even hardcore political nationalists, separatists and chauvinists pretend that engagement for the nation is unpolitical. There are many examples, but I only single out Thomas Mann's Betrachtungen eines Unpolitischen, published at the end of the First World War. Mann, in 1918, was not yet the cosmopolitan Nobel Prize winner of later years. This tract is a piece of nationalistic propaganda, defending German war aims and war methods. Mann argued that democracy and politics are artificial concepts contrived by the frivolous French and the perfidious English. True Germans have no need for such politics. They stand united as a single nation behind their culture and their soldiers. Two centuries after Walter Scott and a century after Mann, we have become accustomed to the idea that loyalty to the nation is natural, anthropological, unpolitisch that nationality is a moral thing rather than a social one. Surely there is nothing wrong in cheering your national football team. The Englishness of Downton Abbey is a matter of family values and decent domesticity and offered as family entertainment. The politics are there, sometimes the Irish question is mentioned, or the economy, but only as in in incidental dissonance in the jolly feel-good stories about a harmonious organic community. 
Even the aggressive na heroism of national epics, like Braveheart, will romanticize their aggressively national message as unpolitical. To begin with, the hero's defense of the nation is always presented as being fundamentally about freedom, the vrijheid van het Nederlandse volk. Who could possibly disapprove of freedom? Freedom, like family values, is a universal. But in these epics, it just so happens that the tyrants are invariably foreign, and oppression is always something imported from abroad. Lack of freedom within the home country is never ever thematized. Much as the servants in Downton Abbey cheerfully embrace their subservience, so too the hero's home society is always represented as uncoerced, harmonious, egalitarian, where freedom is always a given, never a cause. It's only put in question when the strangers come. Slaves? Anyone? Servants? Anyone? Subaltern women? Anyone? Perish the thought. Freedom here does not refer to the individual's liberty and their empowerment to pursue their happiness. It refers purely to the military expulsion of tyrannical invaders from abroad. What is called freedom is in fact armed self-defense and it refers to a territory rather than to a society. In an Orwellian misdirection, social freedom is redefined to mean national sovereignty. And the warrior hero who loudly shouts freedom is in fact an authoritarian commander trying to sound charismatic. The other form of romantic camouflage is this. These movies are nothing if not melodramatic, by which I mean that they follow stark black and white contrasts. The storyline avoids complexity, avoids mixed emotions. It yo-yos between scenes of delightful bliss and anguished despair. The characters are sharply divided between heroes and villains, between good guys and bad guys. How bad the bad guys are is invariably demonstrated by the fact that, just for fun, they rape, torture, and kill women and children. Indeed, these nationalistic movies are, without exception, full of horrendous violence against defenseless victims, mostly women. Their suffering demonstrates the lustful, sadistic malice of the bad guys, and that, in turn, explains and justifies the righteous anger of the heroes and of the spectators. D.W. Griffith's classic Birth of a Nation, the prototype movie of American nationalism and white supremacism, features actors in blackface impersonating freed slaves of African descent. Their main purpose is to pursue and rape screaming, terrorized white women. Those women are then saved or avenged by the movie's real heroes, the Ku Klux Klan. Yay. In Alexander Nevsky, the Teutonic Order, against whom our hero defends the Russian land, Ruskaya Zemya, throw innocent babies into the fire. And in Braveheart, what motivates Mel Gibson's battle fury is the rape and murder of his young wife by the English army. Those scenes of torture and sexual violence are lovingly and lingeringly represented. These films are as sadistic as the villains they denounce. The emotional manipulation is obvious. We share the hero's disgust at the revolting depravity of the villains, and we understand why the heroes are driven to violence. The melodrama takes us from screaming women to raging men. And so, the national conflict is played out in the very intimate arena of our primal emotions, our feelings about family, loved ones, and children. Those feelings are unpolitical, but they are manipulated melodramatica, melodramatically to justify a message of national warfare and territorial sovereignty. Movie plot lines are full of such melodramatic devices. They have been flourishing across the 20th century in increasing intensity as historical fiction moved to the mass entertainment of the modern action movie and as romanticism became sentimentalism. During the interwar period, we find epic hero worship in the romantic tradition everywhere in the European cinemas. After 1945 and during the Cold War, the genre survived mainly in the communist countries of Central and Eastern Europe. In the USSR, in communist Poland, Czechoslovakia, Bulgaria and Yugoslavia, in Hungary and in Romania. This communist fosterage 
of national epic melodramas is remarkable. It may help to explain why nationalism made such a very strong comeback in Central and Eastern Europe after the fall of communism. But cinema is a global industry, stretching beyond Europe from Hollywood to Bollywood. When we move out from the 19th century into the 20th and 21st, we must also broaden our geographical scope to take in the wider world. Nationalist melodrama has proved itself a very strong presence in the cinema of emerging nation states everywhere. India has been a major player since late colonial times and early independence. Latterly, Turkey has been successfully exporting its nationalistic TV serials throughout the Islamic world. In these countries, too, the action thematizes themes and tropes that had been made popular and canonical in the 19th and early 20th century. And the action makes grateful use of heroic and colorful historical settings. In the case of Turkey, Osmanli tribal history and sultans like Mehmet II, Abdul Hamid II, or Suleiman the Magnificent. Thank you, Melton Burak and Kadir Dede. In the case of India, anti-British or anti-Mughal heroes, with many thanks to Bob von der Linde. This is where we see romantic nationalism going global in the 20th century. The themes may be older, but their celebration and their canonical form can be dated back to the 19th century romantically inspired cultural nationalists. There is also a remarkable convergence worldwide in how these national heroic action movies are presented. Foregroundedly, there are always rough-hewn heroes with bad hair and a kick-ass attitude glaring at us defiantly against a tempestuous background of stormy skies and battlefields. They look ready to storm the capital in Washington, as it were. <laughs> their aggression, their to toxic masculinity are validated by the fact that they commit their violence in the service of the nation and something that they choose to call the nation's freedom or liberty. Movies like this are unrestricted in the Bourdieu sense. They can be easily and cheaply enjoyed by private customers on their domestic couches, watching, on their, watching their home screens with a bucket of popcorn on their laps. While we snack the popcorn, we are outraged when a foreign tyrant commits rape or murder, and we cheer when the foreign tyrant meets his gory end. All that takes place at the most intimate, emotional, private level. National here, nationalism here becomes a visceral affect, a private and unpolitical emotional state. Thus, the scalarity of the genre connects the intimate individual level, where the action is savored in domestic home entertainment, and the global industry in which these films are produced and distributed. Between the intimate and the global, between emotion and business models, the nation is continuously reaffirmed as the natural middle ground. The nation is the natural locus of our loyalties where human sentiments meet civic engagement. This, ladies and gentlemen, is how romantic nationalism has survived into the 21st century and why it continues nowadays to be the most powerful political ideology in today's world. To conclude, in today's politics, we witness a resurgence of virulent anti-cosmopolitanism. It goes together with a virulent anti-intellectualism, but I leave that be for the moment. Public opinion making is suffused by melodramatic schematizations, playing the invariable trump card of family and country, and where freedom is always monopolized for oneself, not for the rest of humanity. In order to understand and diagnose this new nationalism, it is not enough to analyze the social circumstances in which it prospers. We must also understand how its repertoire and sentiments have been kept in circulation over time. Behind the nationalism that saliently manifests itself in political action, there is the latent, inert, unobtrusive presence in the world of consumer culture. All this remains a necessary task for future research. And I should really have delivered this as an inaugural lecture rather than as a valedictory one. Studying the cultural history of political ideas and national affects is something which, in taking my leave, I recommend to my colleagues at the Department of European Studies at this university. I wish them fortitude and success in maintaining a place for the historical humanities in the analysis 
of international relations. It is not in the nature of elderly men to be optimistic about that sort of thing. But what I can more happily admit to is gratitude. I have plenty of reasons to be thankful. What confidence I have in the future is most of all vested in my students. As I am learning the brittle art of growing old, I notice, as Marcus Aurelius and Bob Dylan did, that students remain forever young. <laughs> European studies is attracting bright and committed students from many countries. In this cosmopolitan city, they create a massively inspiring intellectual buzz. These students continue undaunted and full of energetic curiosity, the core business of the university and of the humanities, to learn and propagate the best that is known and taught in the world. May those of you who have a calling for continuing research find a stimulating environment to pursue that calling, ideally in a research master's program in European studies. <laughs> that, like Western civilization, sounds like a good idea. Dear students, to meet your eyes across the benches of lecture halls, as I do now, has always been one of the great ongoing joys of academic life. Keep your eyes bright, your mind sharp, your companionship cheerful, and may you stay forever young. Secondly, I thank the university librarians and the faculty's secretarial and administrative staff. Dear friends, in choosing to be flexible rather than rigid, personable rather than officious, you have the secret invisible power to turn the academic work floor into a human community. So often you have done just that. It was you most of all who made me feel at home in this university. We often talk of rooted cosmopolitanism and that phrase always makes me think of you because it is you guys who root this university, who provide a home ground for this transnational temple of learning right here in this proud and kind city of Amsterdam and among straightforward and unintimidated Hollanders. When I started at European Studies in 1986, I was one of the young ones, looking up to elder statesmen like Wim Robel and Max Weisglas and our founding father, Albert Rijksbaron, who I'm so happy to see right there in the front row, and my dear and departed friend, Arthur Mitzman. Now I am following them into retirement, and my colleagues all seem so young, and I feel a bit like an uncle to them, sometimes grumpy, but always affectionate. <laughs> the people whom I saw obtain tenure, Yolanda, Marlene, Christina, Mayed, Guido, Alex, the precariat of young PhDs and guest researchers, Enno, Tim, Linda, Yessa, Aisha, Bob, Thomas, and Eva, Suda, Robin, and again Mayed, who are taking over our flagship book series, it's all of you, and it's up to you now to maintain our mission to learn and propagate the best that is known and taught in the world. I'm glad to leave it to you guys when I see what a committed and talented bunch you are, and above all, when I see the heartwarming collegiality that you can draw on. May that collegiality help you through the challenging times which the humanities are facing and which the culture, historical humanities are facing in particular. I thank all my past and present colleagues, for all the collegiality that they have shown me. And here's a shout out in particular also to a few of those whose practical support helped me to prepare this lecture. It is the tip of an iceberg. To thank all those to whom I am indebted would amount to an entire autobiography. In other words, my autobiography would consist largely of acknowledgments of gratitude, gratitude to the whole world, and under God to so many people in it. To be able to say that is a mighty blessing. And most importantly of all, bracing herself and sitting right in front of me, there is Anne Rigney. This lecture has demonstrated from beginning to end the many, many ways in which her work has been an inspiration to me ever since our student days. I should acknowledge that huge intellectual debt as a matter of common academic decency. Anne, there you are, with our children, Anna and Paddy, beside you. Over the past 45 years, so often and in so many different places, we've looked around and looked at each other and we said, well, here we are. Here we are with the whole family. And what a marvelous walk in the park it has been. 
and I see you squirm, so I'd better stop right here. I want to thank all of you for being here, and I want to do that in my native language and by returning to my own, my native land. In these closing seconds, please go back in time with me to a moment long before the rise of nationalism. In 1130, near my hometown of Maastricht, a gathering of learned nuns took place in the convent of Münsterbilse. The meeting was recorded on one of the blank leaves of the convent's gospel book. And the names of those studious women are listed. And 900 years later, we can still read out the roll call. Gerberga, Lutgardus, Oda, Mechtildis, Engelberta, Elisabeth, Gertrudis. And underneath is written, in a mixture of Latin and medieval Limburgish, Desi Samenunge was edele underscone, et omnium virtutum pleniter plena. This gathering was noble and fair and fully replete with every virtue. Quite so. Hartelijken dank voor uw aandacht. Ik heb gezag wat ik te zeggen hou. Het is goed geweest. Tot voor een zijn drinken. We uh, haven't quite finished yet. Um, het is een uh, eer om uh, de volgende spreker te vragen. Dat is professor Dr. José van Dijk, universiteitshoogleraar Media en Digitale Samenleving aan de Universiteit van Utrecht, maar natuurlijk ook voorheen hoogleraar aan deze faculteit en ook decaan aan deze faculteit. Dus alstublieft. Dank je wel. Hooggeleerde professor Leersen, geniet er nog maar van. Nu kan het nog. Lieve Joep, ik begin even met een raadsel. Wat is moeilijker dan een cirkel vierkant maken of een voetbal door een trechter halen? En het antwoord is, in vijf minuten een overzicht geven van Joep Leersens leven en werk. Dat is niet zomaar moeilijk, dat is onmogelijk. Maar het was me wel opgedragen en dat ga ik dan ook hier proberen. Joeps carrière als hoogleraar en de oogst van zijn professionele leven is in slechts één metafoor uit te drukken. De encyclopedie. Een rijk geïllustreerde reeks boeken die de briljante geest van één persoon uitademt en die tegelijk een allesomvattend gezamt kunstwerk is. Een vleesgeworden naslagwerk dat monumentaal is, maar ook dynamisch doorgroeit op het internet. Tegelijk is het een wandelend woordenboek dat niet alleen meertalig is, maar ook nog multicultureel en glokaal. De encyclopedie, kortom, is een metafoor die Joep karakteriseert als intellectueel en als mens. Het fijne van Joep als encyclopedie is dat je niet aan het begin hoeft te beginnen, maar dat je willekeurig zomaar ergens in medias race een bladzijde kunt openslaan. Bijvoorbeeld een bladzijde in 2008. Joep wint de Spinoza-prijs en ik mag als trotse decaan van de FGW bij de uitreiking zijn. Het feest in de statige Haagse kerk wordt eigenlijk pas echt een knalfeest als de harmonie St. Cecilia uit Meer, speciaal hiervoor naar Den Haag getogen, de instrumenten oppakt en een serenade brengt aan hun illustere fluitspeler. Meer dan 50 jaar heeft Joep dan in die harmonie gespeeld en tot de dag van vandaag oefent hij trouw mee met zijn orkest. Opgeleid aan het conservatorium is zijn investering in de muziek een even langdurig als zijn toewijding aan de wetenschap. Een wandelende encyclopedie als Joep heeft de unieke gave om zijn onuitputtelijke kennis van zowel tekst, beeld als muziek te combineren. Cultuurgeschiedenis is niet alleen zijn kennisdomein, hij praktiseert wat hij preekt. Verbroedering door kunst, cultuur en kennis. Nog een willekeurige bladzijde. Op een middag in 2018 presenteert Joep zijn Encyclopedia of Romantic Nationalism in Europe voor de ingewijde Ernie. Ik heb het woord zo net nog niet gehoord. 
Hier in uh, Spui 25, hier om de hoek. Twee bakstenen van boeken vol met lemma's over belangrijke culturele personen in de Europese geschiedenis. En die boeken die zijn het resultaat van een ongekend staaltje netwerken, offline en online. Want honderden collega's uit tientallen landen hebben eraan bij, aan bijgedragen. En op het internet breidt Ernie lustig verder als een spin, ook weer zo'n acroniem, in het web. Duizenden draadjes worden er geweven om een 19e eeuwse intellectuele kathedraal op te trekken op een 21e eeuwse rhizomatische fundering. En wie deze uiterste kan verbinden is meer dan een wetenschapper. Hij is een kunstenaar die als een orkestleider iedereen op het juiste moment betrekt bij de uitvoering, dat gezamenlijke productieproces. Die losse bladzijden in Joeps leven worden aan elkaar geregen door een reeks van plaatsnamen. Meer, Maastricht, Aken, Utrecht, Amsterdam, Dublin, Dingle, Harvard, Toronto en via Utrecht en Maastricht weer terug naar Meer. Het lokale en het globale, het kosmopolitische en het regionale, Joep is de polyglot die even vloeiend is in dialecten als in een handvol wereldtalen. Als de wandelende encyclopedie zijn kennis spuit, dan is dat in een taal, een toon en een timbre die passen bij het onderwerp. Niet alleen collega's van de FGW aan de UvA, maar ook in de rest van Nederland hebben mogen genieten van Joeps illustere directeurschap van het Huizinga Instituut tussen 1995 en 2006. En wie niet onmiddellijk bezweek voor zijn intellectuele en verbale virtuositeit, deed dat zeker voor zijn onvermoeibare collegialiteit. Als decaan en later als president van de KNW heb ik nooit, echt nooit vergeefs, en ik heb het heel vaak gedaan, een beroep gedaan op Joeps inzet. Ook al leek hij wel eens verlegen smeken naar het plafond te sparen, slaren, please, als ik het weer eens hem voor de zoveelste keer trots aankondigde als onze eigen Spinozis, ofwel de Dutch equivalent of the Nobel Prize. Please, zei hij dan. Nog zo'n willekeurige pagina in Joeps geschiedenis. Voor de zoveelste keer, en ik ben echt de tel kwijtgeraakt, wordt hij voorgedragen voor docent van het jaar. Nou, voor de meeste docenten is dat een droom die misschien, heel misschien, één keer in hun leven werkelijkheid wordt. Voor Joep is het bijna een terugkerend, le uh, terugkerend lemma in ieder hoofdstuk van zijn loopbaan. Steeds nieuwe generaties hangen aan zijn lippen en halen nieuwe woorden of inzichten uit zijn fluide bouche, zijn verbal flow. Voor studenten, en we hoorden het net ook weer, voor studenten is Joep van alle tijden. Je kunt hem op iedere bladzijde van hun leven ook weer openslaan. Het mooie, dames en heren, van encyclopedieën is dat ze nooit klaar zijn. Dat ze altijd kunnen blijven doorgaan en dat ze in principe oneindig zijn. Dat geldt helaas niet, niet voor ons mensenlevens. Maar eerlijk gezegd zie ik onze encyclopedie Joep voorlopig nog wel even doorwandelen. Niet alleen in de heuvels van Zuid-Limburg of de glooiende kustvlakte van West-Ierland, maar ook in zijn wetenschappelijke projecten. Want in die alsmaar uitdijende spin-offs van Ernie zijn altijd weer nieuwe openingen te vinden voor verdieping, verlenging of verbetering. En de wandelende encyclopedie ziet nimmer beren op de weg, maar slechts vrienden die een eindje mee willen lopen. De reizende encyclopedie vraagt nooit waar die vandaan komt, maar alleen waar dat project heen gaat. Lieve Joep, aan elk afscheid, hoe leeftijdsfunctioneel ook, zit toch een weemoedig randje. Ik denk dat ik namens vele leden van de academische gemeenschap aan de UvA, de Universiteit Utrecht, de Universiteit Maastricht en de KNW spreek, als ik je bedank voor alles wat je de afgelopen jaren voor ons gedaan hebt. Voor de wetenschap, voor de kunsten en voor de mensheid. Want je grootste verdienste als wandelende encyclopedie heb ik nog niet eens benoemd. Dat is jouw hartelijkheid, je warmte, je medemenselijkheid en vooral je enthousiasme. It's infectious. Iemand met zoveel uitstraling als jij is behalve een encyclopedie vooral ook een open boek. Een boek waarvan iedereen op elke bladzijde mag meegenieten. Je gunt meelezers de aanstekelijkheid van jouw passie en de gulheid van je kennis. Je nodigt iedereen uit om mede-auteur van jouw gemeenschap te worden. Of die community nu meer is, Amsterdam 
of de Europese academia. Je kunt de jongen uit het dorp halen, maar het dorpsleven gaat nooit uit de jongen. En dat is maar goed ook. Gelukkig maar. Joep, ik hoop dat wij en vele andere collega's nog heel vaak een stukje met je mee mogen wandelen. Het maakt niet uit waar je begint, want eindigen doet hij nooit. De encyclopedie van jouw geest. Het gaat je goed. Still we're not finished. I'd like to uh, invite my colleague, Dr. Alex Trace Francis, to uh, come to the stage with uh, a small presentation, but also something more. So, Alex. Thanks very much, uh, Guido. Uh, Alex Trace Francis, I'm the associate professor in uh, Europe's uh, chair group. I'm still working on the beard, but um, hopefully that will come. Yeah. Um, for those of you who are here um, this morning, uh, we had a mini symposium in which we reviewed Professor Learson's uh, intellectual achievements and activity. We had visiting professors uh, speak about themes in his work. We had colleagues uh, evoking uh, memories of uh, Joop's uh, youth and uh, ideas of what's uh, working with him. Yeah. And uh, Professor Van Dyck has also now given us a wonderful um, a summary of, of, of Joop's intellectual and personal qualities. So I'm not here to uh, repeat that. But having read his work, you can see the range there. He's done monographic work uh, on modern and early modern Irish literary culture. He's done synthetic work, uh, a brilliant uh, textbook um, survey such as National Thought in Europe. Uh, he's done encyclopedic work uh, with the Encyclopedia of Romantic Nationalism in Europe. Uh, but perhaps above all, he's done catalytic work. You know, he's really, it's just come across today, and I think everyone knows this, uh, the extent to which he's been able to motivate and mobilize people, not unlike some of the national activists whom he studies uh, in his work, but hopefully uh, in a good way. Yeah. And again, for those of you who were there this morning, then colleagues got together and presented him uh, with a uh, material gift, um, uh, which he was told about in advance um, and asked what he wanted. Um, for those of you who weren't there, what you wanted most, uh, was a pair of ship's clocks, um, which were duly purchased and produced and presented uh, this morning. Yeah. What I'm here to present today is, in fact, not a material gift, but an intellectual gift, although, um, as you know, all intellectual activity has a material uh, side to it. Yeah. Uh, together with colleagues, uh, whose names I will uh, list fully at the end, um, uh, from uh, 2020, then we have been thinking uh, a little bit catalytically in your spirit as how to uh, honor his intellectual uh, legacy and also how to respond to it. Yeah. Um, we therefore contacted a number of his associates, um, uh, friends, collaborators uh, in different countries. And remarkably, uh, by the beginning of 2021, uh, we had no fewer than uh, 26 people uh, wishing to contribute uh, to a volume uh, in its honor. And now it's about time that I take the book out of the bag, um, which I will do now. Yeah. Um, we chose as a theme uh, for a volume of studies in honor of Professor Leerson, uh, the title, the alliterative title, Europe is very fond of alliteration, as am I, um, Networks, uh, Narratives, and Nations. Yeah. We thought these three terms uh, perhaps best summed up the kind of interlocking approach uh, which Yub has to the study of nationalisms the way that nations are produced uh, through networks and narratives and how the process is interlocking and circular. Yeah. The volume bears the subtitle, Transcultural Approaches to Cultural Nationalism in Modern Europe and Beyond. Yeah. As mentioned, it has 26 uh, contributors. Uh, I'm not going to read out all their names here. The volume will be on display uh, in the hall. Don't spill your peanuts or still less your orange juice over them, please. Um, so we have here um, a part one simply entitled National Questions uh, with major contributions. We have John Hudson, Hutchinson, Peter Burke, other major figures in nationalism studies. Uh, network Nations, uh, con a section led by uh, Professor Anne Rigney, someone perhaps known to, um, to you. Uh, uh, we have a section three on uh, canonicity and culture, um, again uh, with leading uh, contributors Lotte Jensen, Eric Storm, uh, David Hopkin, Jo Tollebeck, 
Uh, we have a section four on historicity and narrative, and this has been a big theme of uh, Joop's work. Uh, Anne Dooley, uh, uh, Tom Shippey, Valas Trencheni, uh, Roy Foster, uh, Ina Ferris. And finally, a part five on imagology, identity, and alterity. Yeah. Marianne Constantine, uh, Manfred Bella, Michael Wintle, uh, and again, uh, many others. Uh, we have also a list of acknowledgments, uh, which uh, another favorite genre of, of Yupes, which he excelled in today. Um, and we have uh, a very nice index, 15 page uh, index, as well as places, uh, it's uh, thematic. Yeah. Um, so here we are. This is what it looks like. It's got a light blue cover. Um, it's got a picture uh, which is in fact entitled Hip Hip Hurrah, um, which is an image of a, um, a celebration by a, uh, a group of Swedish artists at a colony in the second half of the 19th century, uh, uh, put forward by another of the contributors, Anne-Marie Thies, who has written about this topic on the, um, uh, in the volume. Yeah. Um, now, I've been using the word we a lot, so I ought to say really who is we. Um, there are in fact eight people um, who are guilty of this, um, um, of this production, and uh, their names uh, fitted uh, quite elegantly, I think, on the cover. It's always difficult to get eight names on the cover, especially since half of us have double-barreled names for our sins. Yeah. Um, uh, so the names are, and I'd actually like the people to stand up, if they could, I think seven, as I read out your name, uh, Mariette Brolsma, can you make yourself known yeah, to the police? Yeah. Alex Trace Francis, I'm here already. Uh, Christina Loyosh, yeah, if you could stand up, please, at the back, Christina. You can stay standing up if you, if you, if you want so that everyone can see you. You don't want to, yeah. Um, Eno Marsen cannot be here, unfortunately. Uh, Marlene Renson. Marlene, yeah. Uh, Jan Rock. Uh, I'd like to particularly emphasize Mayette, uh, Mayette and Jan's role in also doing the index, um, not the least of tasks. Yolanda Rodriguez Perez. There we go. And now, last but not least, uh, Guido Snell. Yeah. Okay, that's all for me. I'm going to come to you. You can stay where you are. Um, well, do you want to come up? And, yeah. If we've got people who want to photograph. <laughs> Nobody told me anything about it. Nobody breathed a word. This is, I'm totally flabbergasted. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I'm speechless, and I, I should not have the last word on this. Thank you so much. This is really overwhelming. <laughs> Er is uh, gelegenheid om uh, Joep te feliciteren, om hem te omarmen, denk ik ook. Uh, er is meer ruimte dan anders. U wordt mede door de pedel uitgenodigd om straks ook gebruik te maken van de ruimte hier. Dat zal een lange rij zijn, maar ga vooral eerst ook hier een drankje nemen en dan kunnen we elkaar allemaal spreken. Dus hartelijk dank allemaal. Thank you.